Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good. I I apologize. I apologize. I, whoa, I I almost, I had the uh, iPad in my hand. Let me just explain. Uh, Everything just went horribly wrong right there. I was just getting ready to say good evening. I, I, you, you probably heard something like uh, something like that because I literally got ready to say good evening and I got ready to move my hands forward and the iPad that I'm holding in my hand literally almost just went flying across the room. So I was like, uh, and I, but it, it, it didn't go. So let's do this again. I say I almost want to stop and start over, but I'm live on the air. There's no stopping and starting over. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, everyone. It is Tuesday, April the 26th, 2022. It is currently 7.22 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live two stories above a street here in Abilene, Texas, where it has been a crazy, well, 48 hours, almost 48 hours. It's been absolutely crazy and uh, well, I'm, I'm just going to take some time this evening to tell everyone about it, to tell you where I've been, why there hasn't been any live broadcasting, why you haven't seen too many things posted, because, well, I've been completely out of sorts, and you can tell just by trying to start this program, well, everything, well, well, is out of sorts, because that's what it's felt like the last two days. Let me tell you what happened. On Monday morning, I had to report to the Taylor County Courthouse for jury selection. Now, what was weird is, you know, whenever you get your summons for jury duty, you know, you get that phone number to call. And typically when you call it, they'll be, if you are, if your summons number was somewhere between this number and this number, you need to report. Or if it, if you're, if you are not between this number, you don't have to report, whatever the case may be, but they usually give you a, a certain, you know, section of numbers from one to 1000 have to report anything else. You don't have to report something along those lines. Well, this time it was really weird because you called and they basically said, if you received a summons, like doesn't matter what, what number is on it. If you received one, you must show up. In fact, I was like, wait a minute. It always tells me if, if your summons number is between this number and this number, you have to show up. I've never heard one just like, if you got one, doesn't matter what the number is on it, you must show up. I, I knew something was, was a little off. In fact, I, I called the number back a second time just to make sure I heard the, the recording correctly because I'm like, wait a minute. Usually it's like if, if your summons is between this number and this number, there's like everyone show up. So we, when I got there Monday morning, early Monday morning, it was just absolute, it was crazy. There were so many people. And basically what they told us is like, here's the deal. Because of the COVID pandemic, we basically, let's, there, there's all these, we, we are so far behind in these trials that we need to do that we basically need everyone, basically everyone. If you're here right now in this room, unless you've got a very, 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 very good reason, you're not going anywhere. And we're going to break you into like groups of, I think, 40. You're going to go to different parts of the courthouse. There we're going to try to then take that that group of 40 and then choose the 12 for that particular trial or this particular trial because there was going to be all these different trials going on. So so initially it looked like I was going to be a part of like a capital m- murder case. Uh, but when I – so I, I ended up obviously make, you know being broken down to one of those groups of 40, told to come back at like 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Monday uh, to go through the process – of selecting 12 for that particular trial. But when I came back to the courthouse at around one, they kind of diverted me to a different one and said, well, you're going to be over here now uh, because they were, they were trying to move everyone around. It was just, it was just chaos. And uh, I end up not in a capital murder case, but in a case dealing with basically family violence is the best way, or I should say relationship violence, because the legal term of a family relation or, or of, yeah, that, that, that term is legally speaking 
can refer to a lot of things other than what you would think as like a mother, father, child. It can, it, it goes way beyond that. So just say uh, people in a relationship and some form of violence took place. That's the best way to put it, all right? So we go through, we, we, we get put in the room, and they start with all of their discussion of legal terms and, and legal uh, philosophy and legal policy and, and all of these things, and they narrow it down, narrow it down, narrow it down, and finally, they tell us to leave, and they call us all back in, and they're going to select the 12, and lo and behold, I get chosen as one of the 12. I got chosen the la- I, I, I It feels like if I, if I make it to the panel, then I'm going to get selected. It just seems that's the way it works for me. But I ended up getting chosen to be on the jury. Now, the reason I want to just talk about this right now is because, well, I... I would have to give some kind of explanation of where I've been and what's been going on because I like to do that for my podcast. I like to kind of make it just more personal, not just, you know, hey, I'm here to talk about something, but just because I think I think when you're dealing with Christianity and doctrine and theology, there's a lot of theoretical aspects to doctrine and theology, but there should always be a practical aspect. And so I like to have this program as like just a, a person. I tend to, to describe it this way. I'm just a sinner sitting in front of a microphone, but I like to share a lot about what's going on in my own life because I think there can be lessons and illustrations from that. And you hear my own struggles and my ups and downs. And so I just like it to make a, a far more personable approach, if that makes some sense. So I, I, it, I didn't want to just make this an introduction to trying to talk about something else because people are like, you spent 20 minutes talking about that. Well, in this particular case, well, you know when you clicked on it what it was about, right? So th- that's why we're talking about it. So I get selected. I get selected. And just a couple of hours ago, we gave our verdict on the case, just a couple of hours ago. And to be honest with you, I'm still, I'm still out of sorts about it. I'm still, I, I, I can't describe the feeling. It, it's, there's almost like an uneasiness inside of me. I, I, there's almost like a, like, I, I, I almost feel like I'm shaking uncontrollably. It's just, I'm not, it was an unpleasant experience to say the least. And I just don't feel, I don't, I don't even know how to describe how I feel. It's, it's probably when, when I when I got ready to start, why I almost flung the iPad across the room is because I think my, my hands are still shaking because I'm just so bothered by it, by the entire experience. But let, let, I'm not going to go through the entire case. Obviously, I'm now I'm now free to talk about the case, but I don't want to go through all the details. Let me just say this. Um, it was one of those cases where you have two individuals Two human beings who created in the image of God, who found themselves together and loosely defined as a relationship, okay? Some physical intimacy, but they had not even been living under the same roof for, I think, maybe not even a full two weeks, maybe just a little over a week, if, if even that. They'd been living together for a very, 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 very short period of time. But they were living in just absolutely, it's just hard to describe conditions, right? The photographs from the house is just, it was just, just a bad situation. It it was just ugly. And it just, the situation was ugly. And it sounds like that both individuals maybe have had some very ugly experiences in their past. It was just Everything about it, you just want to go, how horrible. No, you don't want to see anyone in those situations. And you can say, well, some people like to just sit back in judgment and say, well, they put themselves in that situation, their own foolish decisions, and they got what they deserve. And I, 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 who, I hate that feeling. I don't, I don't like that, that attitude. Here are human beings, whether by their own horrible decisions or by consequences uh, or by the circumstances that they found them themselves in that kind of led them here. They ended up together. It's not a good situation. You could use the word toxic. You could just use the word bad, but it's just you feel horrible that human beings find themselves in these situations. And there's human beings all around the world, you know, tonight in horrible situations. 
uh, whether it's because of their upbringing, whether it's because of drugs, whether it's because it's alcohol, wh- whatever the situation is, they find themselves there. And yes, you can, I'm not in any way denying people's responsibility, but you still feel horrible for people there. And you wish that, you know, you wish that you could just walk up to anybody who's in these horrible situations and just simply say, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better there's got to better be a better course for your life. There, there, you, you just wish, like to me, for me, it, I, I don't, I don't take any pleasure in seeing other people in these horrible situations and either feeling like I'm, I'm morally superior or I made better decisions. What I feel is I don't care about me. I care about what, I wonder what could have been done to, to get them out of said situation. I wonder what could be done going in the future to keep them from those kinds of situations. But these two individuals are just, their past is a mess. They, uh, they're, they're together. And lo and behold, they end up in an argument. And, and this is just, this is just so, ab- it, it's hard to even say it because it's so utterly ridiculous, but it's true. They basically end up in an argument over video games. Video games. Now, depending on which side of the story you want to go with, the male and the the male who was the defendant, who was the one being accused, and the the female who was the victim. Depending on who you listen to, the argument over video games erupted either because, well, the girl got upset because the guy was playing video games and ignoring her, or if you listen to her, the guy was upset because instead of basically paying him attention while playing video games, she was she rather to watch other people play video games on YouTube. Either way, people felt like, I guess, I guess you could say it really wasn't about YouTube or it really wasn't about video games. It really wasn't about YouTube. It really, I guess was either person wanted the other person's full attention. Maybe, maybe if you look below the surface, it was really like both people going, I want your full attention. And if you don't give me your full attention, then you're not treating me the way I want to be treated. And who knows the next thing, you know, it exploded into physical violence. And both of them showed the mar- marks of that physical violence. Neither one of them left the, the conflict without some kind of physical wounds in it. It was bad, it was ugly, and it was disturbing. The cops showed up, um, and when the cops showed up, basically, they, they see the girls sitting outside on the porch crying. The guy is inside and they take the girl's statement. They don't take the guy's statement. The guy is arrested basically on the spot. The girl is seen as the victim. The guy is seen as the aggressor. He go, And he goes to jail, and they never even get an actual statement from him. He, he's not even able to give a statement. The, the, the woman's statement is very short. There's not really a lot there. And in the whole, the whole case, because the, the way the Texas law is written, it really came down to this. It wasn't, it wasn't about the violence. It wasn't about anything. It was about this one basic issue. Did he impede her airway, cutting off some form of breathing or blood circulation? Did he impede her, her breathing in any way, shape, or form? In other words, you could call it a choke. She claimed he did choke her. He, uh, she claimed he did choke her. He claimed he did not. So you have... Two conflicting stories. Their stories are night and day different, like nowhere close to the same. Both seem to agree that violence took place. He tries to agree it's self-defense. She's trying to agree it's self-defense. But the bottom line is, did he choke her? That's really the only question we had to, to come to. And we had to be able to come to that to a conclusion about that beyond reasonable doubt. But again, for me, it, it was like there, these are two... Two human beings, and uh, I. It was just so sad. It was. It was just so sad. So we listened to. Uh, they, they brought in the police officers. They didn't have much. They didn't have much help. What one of the things that made it so difficult was 
There was supposedly body cam footage that may have you know, given us some insight, but lo and behold, we didn't have the body cam footage, and lo and behold, the body cam supposedly wasn't working correctly during key parts of supposedly the, inter- the interaction. Supposedly the male officer speaking to the male def- defendant, the one who was accused of being the aggressor, according to the, to the defendant, hey, the cops basically told me, you can tell your story later. You don't need to tell our story now, your story right now. So in other words, they didn't even listen to it. Well, lo and behold, we don't have the body cam footage to whether verify that or not verify that. We don't have anything. The cops didn't say they didn't say that, but they didn't say they did say that. They just basically were like, well, I, I don't know. I don't remember. And <laughs> lo and behold, there's no body cam footage to say whether I did or didn't. So we have no, we have no proof one way or the other. We do know that the cops' actions were like, Hey, buddy, we're, we're not going to listen to you right now. We're just going to immediately put you in handcuffs and arrest you. And we're going to believe the female. That, that's basically the way this is basically the way it went down. I mean, they didn't they didn't really listen to him. So he goes he goes to jail. So the cops testimony is not of much value. Now, supposedly a neighbor came in to try to stop the altercation. But that neighbor did not call 911. That neighbor left, and what's weird is the police never bothered to interview the neighbor, didn't get a statement from the neighbor, and the neighbor was not called into court. So we don't know if the neighbor was actually there or not. The female, the victim, says the neighbor was there. The defendant never mentioned the neighbor. The na- and the and the females uh, the, in the victim's police statement, no neighbor is mentioned. <laughs> so you're like, what? What? What is going on? What is going on here? It's just like, so, so it's like the police testimony is no good. There's, there's this whole thing about a neighbor that is, is not, is, is, it's just, it's, it's, it's just absolutely, it's just crazy. Like, like, like we, we need some kind of, of proof here. We, we need something. Now the female, the, the victim, when all of this was supposedly going on, instead of calling 911, she called someone who lived like 45 minutes away to come get her. Well, her testimony is that, you know, she was basically being under attack and had been attempted to be choked out three times, but she didn't call 911. She called someone who lived 45 minutes away to come get her, which seems kind of odd. But that person that she called to come get her ultimately called the cops. But guess what? The one who called the cops wasn't brought in and we have no statement from that person either. So once again, we just have that, okay, this person called the cops, not the victim. Okay, that that still leaves a lot of. Okay, what what do we have here? They have pictures of the house, all right, which just showed that the house was like it. It didn't necessarily show that anything violent took place. What it showed is that the house was in utter disarray and horrible living conditions. All right, the cops even spoke about how horrible it smelled. There were feces. It was just horrible. So again, horrible, 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 horrible situation that these human beings found themselves in. So we're, we're, we're sitting there trying to figure all of this out. We have the testimony of the victim. We have the testimony of the defendant. Their stories are night and day different. I mean, no, you couldn't get, you could not get more different uh, stories. Uh, the, the victim claims that he threw a chair that basically exploded or broke apart but in the picture, the chair is sitting right there, not broken apart with things sitting on it. So that seems to go against her story. It was just all this back and forth. But the thing we needed was proof that he impeded her airwave, that he choked her. We need proof. We Remember, we've got to believe this. It's got to be proven beyond reasonable doubt because he starts with the presumption of innocence. That's the way our court system works. And I, I love that. He, he, we have to see him as innocent. The state has to prove the case. But the, the state never really proved anything other than she said it happened. He stands up. It didn't happen. The, the one part of testimony where we really wish the state would have like would have jumped in was at one point the the de- male defendant admitted that he had placed the female in a headlock, right? Headlock, that's not impeding the airway, um, and that he took her, kind of kicked her legs out from under her until she went down, 
And then when she said stop, he let go. Um, but the the state attorney did not jump on that and go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, you put her in a headlock? Okay, what kind of headlock? Like, like there, in other words, there was no follow up on that testimony. So we're just left with, he said headlock. She says she was choked. We have no, there's no physical proof you, uh, about like, like, uh, because it, first of all, if it was a, a, a choke with, you know, a part of your arm, not your hands, well, that's not necessarily going to leave a mark of any kind. There was nothing in the eyes that would show that the, the airwaves had been cut off for any serious amount of time that would break, uh, bust an air, uh, an, a blood vessel. So there was nothing there in the eye, and the police didn't even appear to check it in the first place. So we, we don't have any real evidence to prove one way or the other. We got two different stories. Um, the, 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 the male, the, the, uh, the, the defendant, had more scratches, I think, on his neck than the, the victim supposedly had. But again, scratches would not necessarily prove that, you know, that there's just, there was just no way to prove one way or the other. So when we got back, we finally, I mean, the, they went through the case relatively quick. There wasn't a lot they're just, we didn't have a lot. So we get back to the jury room uh, to, to, to do deliberations. And it's, it's, it's just, it's horrible. Basically, the way it worked was 12 jurors, eight of them was just straight up, he's not guilty. He's not guilty. There were four of us who wanted to go with guilt, but we wanted to, to view it as reckless, Right, which means that that he had no intention to 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 do harm, but it was reckless in nature in, in the way they were acting, the what they were doing to one another. And we wanted to give probation, not jail time, because it just seemed like the whole situation was just broken and out of control. So that we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And basically everyone agreed that both, I mean, there was no argument that both of them were beating up each other, but there was no argument. Who started what? All of those questions really had no bearing on the case because our, our part was to prove did he, the defendant, whether knowingly, intentionally, or recklessly impede her airway, you know, uh, and, and plead, uh, impede blood flow, did, did that happen? And we had to be able to say that without a reasonable doubt. The problem is there was too much reasonable doubt because he said no, she said yes, there was no video evidence, there was no physical evidence, there was just, what What, what do we do with this? And it was just, it was, it was just so sad. No, 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 nobody, nobody in the jury room really wanted I think we all felt like this is just this is just a situation that spiraled out of control both part we don't know both parties story is so different to the other that who's telling the truth how do we even know who's telling the truth I mean they're like you got to have some kind of other evidence that would bring in some you know some kind of like okay well this was what was said even the the female story the story she gave the police on the night of the incident and the story she gave on this on the testimony when she gave her testimony today they weren't even the same there were some basic elements that were the same but her story when she gave her testimony today was like wow it was so much different than what she gave the police on the night of the incident it was so it was different and it could be argued well she was upset then okay yeah okay but the story has changed so it could be that she was upset and now she remembers more. It could be now that her memory now is not like there's just so many questions. His story, well, we don't we can't compare it to the original story because he he wasn't question, he wasn't given a chance to give his original story. Which of course then the, the police. But the uh the state, the the state attorney, the district attorney, it, it, what was so frustrating is he did not, when, when the defendant acknowledged that he put her in a headlock, I just really thought the district attorney was going to be all over that. Go, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you sure it was a headlock? Exactly how did this happen? It, like, he should have asked, like, about 30 questions to ensure he described, like, when he kicked her legs down and she went down, did he fall on top of her? 
Did he find himself on top of her and her face down? And was, was her face down on the, on the bed? Because that could have cut off her, her, cut off her airway or, or impede her ability to breathe. Like, but we, the, the, the district attorney did not ask any of those questions. You, you would, I, and it's the district attorney's job, it's the state's job to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. The, the defendant starts off with the presumption of innocence, so he doesn't have to prove his innocence. He doesn't have to prove anything. He already starts off as being the innocent. It's the, it's the prosecution who has to come in and prove guilt beyond reasonable doubt. And we, so we went back and forth, and I, there were some of us who just felt like, you know, he put her in a headlock. He kicked her legs out from under. I, I can almost guarantee he fell on top of her. But it was us trying to prove it. In other words, it wasn't the state who tried to prove it. Now we're trying to prove it. Now all we're supposed to do is go with the facts that were given, not the not trying to fill in the gaps of the facts that were not given. So finally, we had to decide that innocent because it could not be proven, that guilt could not be proven beyond reasonable doubt. But it felt horrible. It felt horrible because there's a part of me that was like, well, okay. Now, yeah, I think even if he, even if he was found guilty, we were going to be doing the sentencing as well. And we already agree that if we even we found guilty, nobody wanted him to go to prison for it because again, the whole situation was so out of control, and there's so many conflicting stories. So he wasn't going to go to jail no matter what we did. So we ended up giving, uh, you know, innocent. So in other words, he doesn't even get on probation. A lot of people wanted him to have probation, but we would have had to found him guilty. And we, so we couldn't find him guilty because we couldn't do so with, you know, beyond without reasonable doubt. We couldn't uh, believe we could not declare that he was guilty beyond reasonable doubt. So we had to say that he was innocent, which that was the presumption that he started off with is that he was innocent. And uh, it was. But when it was done, I remember a number of us going, man, I would feel so bad if he. This guy goes and hurts someone else or is involved in another domestic dispute where, you know, and he hurts someone. And um, I, I got I to gotta live with that now. And I, I felt, you know, when you're sitting there and, you, and the verdict is being read and you're looking, you know, you're looking at the defendant. He's happy. Here's the woman, the accuser. She's clearly not happy. And you're like, no matter what we did there, we were getting ready to impact someone's life. We were getting ready to have a, neg- a, a either a positive or a possibly very negative impact on someone's life. And that is all. That responsibility is so overwhelming to me. Because right now, the woman, the victim, or, or we could say the accuser, she's sitting somewhere now. Probably maybe she may feel betrayed. She may feel let down. She may feel hurt. And I feel horrible about that. I, I don't want that person to feel that way. But at the same time, if I would have uh, declared the person guilty, I would have like, did I, that, I, that, there was too much doubt there. There was, there, there couldn't be any doubt. And there was, so that I would have felt horrible to declare the person guilty. Um, no, no, the way there was no win in this situation. I've been in other, I've been in other court situations where there, it seemed like it, that this is pretty clear. This is pretty obvious, but this one was just so like, What? do we do and uh the i felt good that I, I felt at least i felt that the jury that everyone in the jury tried their best i i always get bothered though that a lot of times the people on the jury seem more bothered or irritated that it's you know taking it's cutting into their day cutting into their time uh people are very just selfish so that kind of bothered me um i'm like yeah, i look i understand that everybody's got things to do but these are people's lives. And most people just like, once the verdict was done, they, I think they were just like, good. To, I mean, maybe they weren't, but it just felt like everybody was like, okay, you know, did my job. I'm going to go home. And I, I walked out of the courthouse and I just kind of walked around the courthouse for a while, just trying to let calm down, just going, man. And I watched the victim. She drove off. I saw the, um, the defendant. Uh, with the uh, defense attorney, I, I really, I don't even know if it would have been appropriate. I wanted to walk up to him and go, look, you just got another chance in life. Don't waste it. Please use it. Please use it for good. Do something great with it. Do something good with your life. 
That's what I wanted to say. But obviously, I don't get to talk to them. I wanted to tell the victim that, hey, I'm so sorry. And it's not that I don't believe you. I, I think something horrible happened. I think probably both of you, you were at fault in some way, shape, or form. But I just could not prove what – I could not say beyond a reasonable doubt that what you claim is uh, is true. I, I can't because the other person saying it's not true. So what makes your testimony more trustworthy than their testimony? You know? And 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 the defense attorney tore her apart. I felt bad for the the accuser because the defense attorney just ripped her apart. It was brutal, and uh, she got all tongue tied and her. I mean, she was all over the place with her testimony. Which you, and again, I can understand nerves and and being upset. But all you can do as a jury is you 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 can't do. You can't, you can't, you can't prove the case. Like, it's not, your job is to take the evidence presented to you. And then from that evidence, can you, beyond a reasonable doubt, say that this person is guilty or can you not? And of of what specifically you're looking for in this particular case, choking. There was no question there was violence. And everyone agreed there on both sides. Both parties were hurting the other person. They were doing physical Damage to the other person. There was no question about that. The issue was, did this choke occur? And I don't know if it did. There's no way for me to know. There's there's no way for me to know. He, he, I mean, there's just, I mean, it was just, it was just horrible, horrible, horrible situation. But that's what happened today. It's over now. I'm glad. We thought we were going to have to go back tomorrow. I am glad it's over. Um, and I say that I'm glad it's over because another another day was not going to change anything unless there was some dramatic evidence out there. There was no more evidence. The evidence given was very – basically came down to two different people telling two different stories. And if you have two people telling two different stories – and nobody can provide any evidence to really prove one right or one wrong, then you almost start off with reasonable doubt right there. Unless I reasonably can believe that this one is telling the truth and this one is not. But and alcohol was involved, of course, of course. Don't even get me started on the wonderful world of alcohol. Alcohol and violence, alcohol and domestic disputes and family violence and and. Uh, Alcohol always shows up in these cases. Always. It's just, I loathe. I hate, I, I despise alcohol with every ounce of my being. I do. I just, I just think you take, you take sinful people. Like everyone's, de- you know, depraved. I, I, I obviously believe in human depravity. You take human depravity and you give it alcohol. I, I don't ever see anything good coming from it ever. Under any circumstances. I, I always say this, I have enough problems with my depravity, I have enough problems with my flesh, I have enough problems with my mind, I have enough problems with my mouth, I have enough problems just being a sinner. The last thing this sinner needs is to take any substance into my body that then begins to influence and hinders my ability to be rational, thinking, my feelings, my emotion, anything that can can impact any of that negatively. That's the last thing a sinner needs to take into their uh, drinking alcohol to me should just be something that I, I don't even care. It's not even about, well, you can't say it's a sin. It's not even about whether it's a sin or not a sin. To me, it's just about just look, if I told, if I believe in human depravity, then why would I want to take anything into my body that would hinder any ability of judgment and rational thought? Why? It just seems like that. That just, just from a purely spiritual, selfish standpoint. And I say being selfish in this sense. I'm being selfish that I want to do what's right spiritually. The last thing I need is alcohol. Absolutely, the last thing I need. The last thing I need. So, but again, it's another case where alcohol is involved. Violence ensued, and. Two people ended up in a bad situation, and their their past was a mess. Who knows if their present is still a mess? I'm hoping that both of them, their futures can stop being a mess, and I, I hope they can get their life together. But those are the people, when you see their stories, 
it makes me wonder, you know, how can as us as Christians get the gospel to people like that? How can we just, you know, look, look at your life. You're, you're engaged in alcohol and all of these other wrong activities. Where is that getting you? It, it like, just from a purely pragmatic standpoint, you're like, you've lived according to the flesh. You've lived your life in the world. And where has it gotten you? Nowhere. Here's, there's got to be something better. There's got to be something better. There's a God. There is mercy. There is grace. There is forgiveness. There is a, a purpose in your life to serve and glorify him. It's got to be better than living. And, and I don't even know how to describe what you're living in. With you, you seem to have no money, no job, no direction, no purpose in life. You're drinking, fighting over video games. There's got to be a life better than that. Now, I'm not saying in any way, shape, or form, make it very clear that I'm better than them. I'm not saying that the average Christian is better than them. Oh, our, uh, we are not better than them. We just, our sins become different than that. But I would hope that Christianity would lead people out of that kind of lifestyle to something better. I don't want to think that I'm sitting there going, we're better than them. I just think that Christianity would, I would think, would offer a life that would be better than that life. Just even from a human perspective, forget the eternal perspective. Forget even forgiveness and mercy and even forget salvation. Just okay, I believe in a God and I'm, I believe in his word and I'm going to try to live my life according to his word. Even that would be better than what they, they were living in and the situation that they found themselves. It's just, a, a, it was just a horrible thing. And I just, and again, I just feel bad. There's two people and I don't know what they're doing tonight. I hope, I hope that the defendant's not drinking. I hope he never picks up another can of alcohol. I can't be sure of that. I hope the female tonight is not so depressed and frustrated that she drinks. I just hope that they get away from alcohol, get away, no drugs, no alcohol, and and try to figure out what they can do with their lives. I've, I've, I've often, I've told lost people this before. If you're lost, right? You don't believe in God. You don't believe in heaven. You don't believe in hell. This is the best this is the best it's ever going to be for you. In other words, it's life and then it, it, there's either something bad after or there's nothingness. But this, So this is the best it's ever going to be for you. This life is all you have. You've got one. This is all you have. So I always, I always tell people, look, if you don't want Christianity, great. You don't want anything to do with God, Jesus, the Bible. Okay, wonderful. But why wouldn't you want to make this life the best it could be? And there's some things that can help you uh, make this life the best it could be. One, stay away from alcohol and drugs. Okay, two, do what you, so stay away from alcohol and drugs too. Do what you can to better yourself and give yourself as many opportunities for a good job, you know, a good career. In other words, learn skills, you know, education, whatever. You think you would do everything you can to improve yourself, to give yourself as much, as many opportunities as possible so that you can live your best life now. I mean, again, without God, this is the best it's ever going to be. This is, this is, this is as great as it's ever going to be for you. This is as, I mean, if you don't have God, this is it. So, I mean, my thing is, is look, you, you don't want God, great. Make the most of this life because this is the best it's ever going to be. For a Christian, what I tend to say, tend to tell Christians is, this is as bad as it's ever going to be. This is as bad as it's ever going to be. It only gets better. For us, if, if, we, if, if God is true, heaven is real, then, then we have an eternity of glory. This is as bad as it's ever going to be. For, for the lost person, this is, as, this is as good as it's ever going to be. This is, as, 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 this is the best life they can have, right? This is the best life they will ever have. This is as good as it can be, right? But for, for us, this is as bad as it's ever going to be. For them, it's the best life that they can have. This is the best it's ever going to be for them. This is the, for us, it's as bad as it's ever going to be for us. It's a completely different perspective on life. 
So you would think if you're lost, you'd be like, okay, man, I'm going, I'm going to do this because I want to see this and I want to have this and I want to do this and I want to get this and I want to, you're going to have all of these motivations because this is it. This is the best it's ever going to be. But for me, this is as bad as it's ever going to be. So I view everything as, okay, that, that maybe I, maybe I can't have that. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe I don't get the pleasure from that, but this this is as bad as it's ever going to be. I'm going to have eternal life in heaven. It, it, to me, it's a different perspective. So I always feel bad when lost people seem to waste the life they have now. So I just feel bad for the people. I feel bad that I had to render. A, I, I, I feel bad that in that particular case, no matter what verdict we came up with, it was not, it, 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 there was no, there was going to be no winners in this situation. There was, nobody was going to win. And there's people right now in your city, my city, their lives are just crumbling around them. It's like, where, where, where are we? Where, where's the church? What, what can we do? And I understand that it's not just as easy as just walking up to someone's life, falling apart, going, hey, Try, you know, try Christ, turn to Christ, because and many of them will be like, get away from me. I don't want any of that. I don't want any of that Jesus stuff. I don't want any of that garbage. And you're like, okay. And then you just watch their lives fall apart. You wish that you, that when you, people reach that level, you could just go, come on, why wouldn't you try this? Why? I mean, just from a purely humanistic standpoint, right? The most pragmatic standpoint possible. Everything you're trying is not working. But many would just rather, I don't know. I, I, I was thinking on every on all the times I drove to the uh, courthouse yesterday and today. I drove there and drove back. I drove down Butternut Street. I know that doesn't mean anything to people who don't live in Abilene, but Butternut Street, it, 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 where, where it stands now used to be the movie theater I used to go to when I was a, a kid every every Friday and every Friday and Saturday pretty much from the time I was around four to about 16 uh, my parents would just drop me off me and my brother I mean we were like five six years old just drop us off at the movie and it was always a double feature and uh, the the older women who old owned that movie theater my dad used to go there when he was little and they they just let us in it didn't matter what the movie was rated didn't matter uh, we got in. Uh, the older ladies would just make sure that we were good to go, you know, uh, when we would walk in. They're like, do you want a hot dog? you want a popcorn? And they would come down every once in a while with their little flashlight and check on us, make sure we were good to go. But we basically, that's where me and my brother spent every weekend pretty much of our entire childhood is at the movie theater. Uh, double feature every night. My brother always fell asleep. I watched both. Um, and, yeah, we watched a lot of movies probably no child should have ever seen, okay? We, the Exorcist is one, okay? So I could go through a number of them, like, you know, disturbed. But um, the, the point is, is where that movie theater used to be, it was torn down, and now they built a Salvation Army. So every time I drove by, there's all these people either just sitting in front or sitting across the street who are all homeless, Many of them are only at the Salvation Army so they can get a meal. Many of them are not looking for any uh, programs or opportunities to get out of their situation. Many are there because of mental health issues. Many are there because substance abuse. But you, you just, whenever I see them, I, I don't know how you, how you see it, but whenever I see people there, I, I just want to stop and, or, or at least I'll slow down and look at them and I go, can you imagine that same person who's now sitting in front of the Salvation Army on Butternut Street in Abilene, Texas, homeless, obviously. Um, if you could see that same person when they were 15 or 16 or 14 or 10, could you have looked at them and go, they're going to end up homeless. They're going to end up drug addicts. They're going to end up alcoholics. No, they had hopes. They had dreams. They probably... Imagine being all kinds of wonderful things, but then here we are all of this time later, and there they are, just their their lives just take and and all I can say is I'm not better than them. I'm not. So I I I I'm just sometimes like only it's only by the grace of God that I'm not there. But then it makes me feel like, but I'm still not better than I'm I just make sure when when one is is in a sense 
saved and kept and preserved from those horrible situations by God's grace. It's not that we're better. And just make sure I'm not better than them morally. I may be better off than them in my situation, but I'm not better off than them morally because I'm a sinner. Just maybe different kinds of sins. But I am still placed in a better situation. And I don't, not because of me, I believe because of God's grace. Without God's grace, where would I be tonight? Would I be, you know, sitting in a courtroom, possibly getting ready to go to jail? Would I be sitting in front of a homeless shelter? I mean, I've done enough in my Christian life to destroy my life, you know, 50 times over. And I, I can never feel that I, I can, I could never, I don't want to ever think that I can't be in those situations because we can be. I mean, you know, I mean look at the Bible, you know, you know, we never would have thought David would have been a person who did what David did. We never, we may have never thought Solomon would have been the person who did all the things that he did or that Peter would have been the denier. We may not even realize that Judas was going to be the betrayer. We can go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. So I, I know I've taken a lot of time tonight, but again, I just wanted to, I'm just trying to process it all. Just a horrible situation where the law requires a certain, be, you know, with a beyond reasonable doubt. And you're like, oh man, I, I, there's just, there's just enough doubt that I can't say guilty, but there's, there's still enough that you want to say, but there should be some guilt. There should be some responsibility. But then I can't prove for sure what you should be held responsible for. I can. I know this. Both individuals could be held responsible for finding themselves in such a horrible, horrible situation. But at the same time, a lot of things could have happened that drove them into that situation. Just know this every day. That you're not strung out on drugs, alcoholic, homeless. You haven't been, you know, you haven't tried to kill someone. Just think of all the, the, the horrible situations that are going on in the lives of people all around you right now as I'm speaking to you. Just think of all the people in horrible situations. Just remember those are human beings creating the image of God. Just Try to remember to pray for them, you know, for people in those horrible situations. Always try to be sensitive to it and just be, thank God every day. Not that, don't thank God that I thank God I'm not like them. Just thank God that God has kept you from so much and has, even in your own failure and sin, has, has put you in a better situation. But when you find people in those horrible situations, we don't look down. We should have mercy and pity. And it's easy just to say, well, uh, you know, sorry that it's there. It, it's just there, there's a callousness to some people. Almost like, man, these people are idiots. These people just look what they did. Okay, is it time to go home? Uh, you know, and it's and I, I'm feeling like, is it time to go home? I, I can come back to my good my good life, come back and turn on a microphone and do a podcast and yeah, go downstairs and get some food and watch some TV and listen to some music and just have a you know a wonderful life. Well, other people don't, and I don't deserve anything that I have. I don't deserve any of it. I'll stop right there. That's been my experience with jury duty this week. I apologize for the rough start, but in some ways that really just captures the whole week. It just, I just, I steal this. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to have a hard time sleeping tonight. It's just, I just feel like there was just no winners today. I just feel like there was no winners. Someone got a, a, a chance today to not, they didn't go to jail. They could have went to prison up to t for 10 years. Uh, we we could have, you know, if they would have been found guilty, we could have gone from 
two years probation to four years probation, or uh, we could have, uh, we could have placed them two years in prison, up to 10 years in prison. We could have fined them up to $10,000. We had a big, lots of different things we could do. A person avoided all of that today. I don't know if they, I can say personally, they deserve that, but I, I can't say beyond a reasonable doubt that they should have been found guilty. So they got an opportunity, a second chance. I pray that they'll make the most of it. And for the, for the woman, I pray that she can move forward. And even though that case did not probably go the way she wanted it to, that she can just find some sense of peace. I mean, I feel horrible for her, but yeah, you can't, you don't, as a juror, you don't make decisions because you feel bad for someone. You got you got to go with the evidence which is presented. All right, everyone have a good night. News, if, yahoo.com. God bless.